to comedy classroom uh, made for and by students of comedy. Uh, this is very exciting because this is the first ever, ever episode. So we're, this is the episode where we find out what the heck this is. But today I have a very, very special guest. Uh, I mean, half, one, one part special because it's my first guest. And second, because uh, she's a very good friend of mine. Um, she is a actor, write, playwright, director, improviser, anything else you want to add to that list? I think that about sums it up. <laughs> cool. Uh, her, this is uh, Joelle Aminga. Uh, oh, I was going to, I remember the, the, le- the other part of the list that I had, recent grad. Oh yeah, that's yeah. important. <laughs> uh, she's she's phoning in all the way from eight from nineteenth century Barkerville. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's good good to have you good to have you on. Yeah, I'm excited for this. This is gonna be great. Yeah, it's good. So I'm gonna start uh, with. How how's how's graduated life like? Is does the shine, does the sun shine a little brighter? Does the wind hit you at a slightly different angle or what? <laughs> um. Well, it's been honestly so great so far. Um, I imagine that you know everybody's experience with graduation is a little bit different. Obviously. Um. Yeah, so mine has been really great. I mean, I when I graduated, I had a job set up right away, so right. it was pretty easy to kind of transition. And uh, I mean, like working in I work in Barkerville, and I've been doing that for the past. Uh, this is my third summer, so it was a pretty easy transition there. I'm sure I'll experience uh, a little bit more about graduated life. Fair one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been really wonderful. Um, and you're going really to, just... you're going to Europe in a little bit. I am. Aren't you? I am. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to Europe in November and I'm going to be there for probably just under a year is what I'm guessing right now. Nice. Um, yeah. So I kind of have a lot planned out, which is really awesome and great. Um, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun just, you know, having the option of now, because I'm not going back to school, I have the opportunity to think of different shows and different projects that I want to work on in the future nice. and who I want to collaborate with and that yeah. kind of thing. So I can start to make those kind of plans and get excited for that sort of thing. Cool, cool. Uh, what mm-hmm. are you doing out in Europe? Um, well, for the first about three weeks, I'm just going to be traveling around. So my parents are actually coming with me for the first three weeks, which is awesome. Nice. Um, and we're going to be traveling to a couple. We're going to be spending a couple of days in London. Um, then we're going to be spending about a week in Belgium, and we're going to be going to uh, a bunch of different Remembrance Day ceremonies and different World War One sites because I'm hoping to write a play about that sort of thing in the future, so I'll be doing some research for that. Ooh. Um, yeah, I'm very exciting. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows when that will happen, but hopefully it will happen. One day. Um, yeah, and then we're going to be going to France, spending a few days in Paris, um, and then we're going to be traveling to the Netherlands for about a week because I have some family there, so we're going to be staying with them. Oh, nice. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that's going to be really great. And then after that, we'll be going back to London, and I actually am going to be um, working in a pub. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's a life. So I'll be working and living in a pub and hopefully just Wait, traveling. Wait, living in a pub? A... Yes, living in a pub as well. Are you just like, are you just going to be like sleeping on the bar floor? Just like pull up a sleeping yeah, bag? Most definitely. That's exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. Pull out a sleeping bag from under the bar and I'm Turn the lights go. a little bit lower. <laughs> no, um, the program that I'm doing, it's called Go International. Okay. Um, and it sets you up with a job in a pub. And normally it's, um, they'll place you in that pub to live as well. So you'll just have a room in the pub. Nice. Um, yeah. 
So I'm going to be doing that and honestly just saving up money to go see as much theater as I can in London. Yeah. Um, traveling around the UK, that kind of Wait, thing. Wait, you're it's, going to see yeah. theater in London? Right? Why would, I was, yeah. Why would you even do why that? Why would I do that? Of all the places. I don't know. I don't, like, it's, theater's not very big in London, no. it's not really a big deal. Like, it didn't even start <laughs> there or anything. No, not at all, it's not any, like it like, has this huge history. I'm, I'm trying to think, are there any, like, big playwrights from London? I, like, actors too, I don't think there's really any big actors in London. We, no. Because we, we both took theater history, I don't think, yeah. I don't, I don't think we've covered there anything a... about London. No. I mean, there was this, like, one little playwright who kind of came out of London. I think right. his name his name was, like, Wh Shakespeare Wh or something. Willie? Willie Shakespeare. Willie Shakes. Yeah. Yeah. Willie, Willie Shakes. Shakes. Yes. I think he was, he came out of there. He like, wrote, he, like, he did a, a lot. He wrote, like, Just a, a couple of really crude comedies, and that was about it. Yeah. That was pretty much it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Um,. Just so, just for the people that don't really know what the heck Barkerville is, what are you doing mm -hmm. at Barkerville? So Barkerville is a historic um, living museum type thing. So it's a historic gold mining town, um, and it is, I believe, the largest or one of the largest um, uh, historical towns in Western Canada. Wow. So it basically is just this whole town that is in the 1870, like 1870s, 1860s, Victorian era, mostly. Right. And what we do in Barkerville is that people can just come to pay to, and go and walk through Barkerville, and there are shops that you can go to and restaurants and that kind of thing. And then they also hire actors to interpret as different characters from that time period. Nice. So... Yeah, so we all play real people who lived in Barkerville um, and either were mining there or whatever, whatever job you could get in Barkerville. So this year I have the privilege of playing Mrs. Hall, who is the school teacher in Barkerville. Um, so every day I teach three school lessons throughout the day. They're about 45 minutes long, so I have a script mm -hmm. for that and we teach that. Um, and then the rest of the day I spend it in the schoolhouse or walking around Barkerville and I just get to talk to the tourists and tell them about the history of Barkerville, the history of the schoolhouse, that kind of thing. Hmm. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun and even it's, it's a really cool opportunity because even though for my lessons I have a set script and the things that I have to go over, I'm also interacting with tourists and with people so right. there's a lot of improvisation that happens yeah um just when people start decide to interrupt me and ask questions and that kind of thing when, when people um, that know you decide they're gonna be clever and yes. try and find <laughs> you out that's very true as well yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's it's honestly so much fun and yeah i mean like i grew up going to barkerville um, and this is something that I wanted to do since probably I was about seven. Wow. So, yeah, it's kind of a dream come true for this at this point. Um, but, yeah, like, the, the history of Barkerville is so interesting to me, and I do not claim to know nearly enough about Barkerville. Like, I know a decent amount that I can make my way through conversations when people ask me questions, but there's just so much history there. Um, right. Yeah, so just being able to share this this Canadian history with different people in a really fun way is really awesome. Right. Cool. So, so uh, with improv, like it, because obviously it's different. It's a different kind of improv than the kind of stuff that we've done at at Trinity Western, mm -hmm. where <clears throat> you're not just like standing on a stage and it's and it's obvious that you're playing. A character mm -hmm. um so what what kind of has that kind of like influ influenced how you how you do improv in a theater or is it kind of like a chicken egg situation um well i would say like yeah i would say they both kind of influence have influenced each other a little bit because 
yeah, like with Barkerville, it's been really good to have that improv experience and that little bit of training for that because in like in improv and at school, we've learned a lot about, you know, just making a choice and committing to it and kind of thinking on your feet and that kind of thing. Yeah. And that plays a big part into Barkerville because you never know what questions you're going to get or what people <laughs> are going to say. So you kind of just have to be rooted in the character that you are yeah. and just kind of go with your impulses and your instincts. And of course these impulses and instincts have to fit with the time period that I'm in. <laughs> I can't just be going doing crazy things because So how do you make butter? Well, I'm uh, a woman man, in 1874. Frick, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me check so, my phone. There's definitely Wait. been like that kind of crossover. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. Can I Google um, that? Yeah, so there's second? definitely been that kind of crossover. <laughs> I've actually like that's the thing where I've so many people come and they try to get me to break character. So there'll be things where especially children, children will come and like just oh. ask you questions trying to get you to mess up. Oh yeah. And so they'll start saying like, "Oh, so when were you born?" I'm like 1850. <laughs> and just look like, them all dead this... in the eyes. <laughs> Yeah, so you just have to, like, you have to know enough that you can actually, you know, passably be able to do that. Right. But then there is a lot of things where, because we don't have any, a lot of specific information about these characters, you do get to, like, kind of make your character a little bit, and nice. you have to make it appropriate to what they would have been, but still... Yeah. Yeah, you you can still kind of make it your own. So, for instance, my character is um, she's a school teacher, but she's also married to the Methodist minister. So mm. she needs to be like respectable and stuff. Right. But I also look at it, and I've seen pictures of her, and I I look at it, and I realize that she's a woman who could just be at home if she chose to, because her husband has a job. Right. So she could just be at home, but she chose herself to go and get her own job. Right. And another little fun fact about history is that in the Victorian era, school teaching was very much still a male profession. Hmm. It was very rare to have female school teachers, which right. is a lot, a lot of people have a little bit of a misconception about that. Yeah. Um, because school t female school teachers become more of a norm in the early 1900s, that kind hmm. of thing. So it was still very much a male profession. So I looked at that and I'm like, hey, this woman went and even though she didn't have to, got herself a job, which should have been a man's job. Hmm. And there's other little things where she's, like in pictures that I've seen, she's dressed very modestly, of course, because she is a Methodist minister's wife. But right. then she has these big, long earrings that she wears. So to me, I kind of see her and she's, she's very respectable and she needs to be, you know, proper and everything, but she likes to rebel in these little ways of like being this kind of forward thinking woman in these little tiny ways of like, I'm going to wear these long dangling earrings with my like plain, like, plain clothes right. <laughs> and I'm going to go get my own job, even though I don't have to have a job. Nice. So, That's cool. yeah, so I get to, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I get to kind of make that, and make those assumptions about the character. So then when I'm at work, that improv experience that I have really comes into play because I can be, I need to be rooted in that character just like you have to do in an improv scene, but right. then you have to just kind of say yes to whatever happens. Yeah, and it does, um, it, it does probably help mm -hmm. that, like, you know, you're waking up every every morning you don't have to necessarily you don't have to be a different character every day yes whereas yes with, that is very helpful whereas with with uh theater improv you're like every five minutes you have to figure <laughs> out what am i <laughs> yes so it's very different in that way and especially with theater improv is you kind of make you, you try to make big choices yeah really big kind of ridiculous choices a lot of the time if you're yeah. one of the more main characters in the scene that sort of thing yeah. whereas this you need to just be a human being <laughs> right like you it, walk it's and not talk like a human exactly walk and talk like a human being um 
But yeah, but then also I've I've kind of discovered that Barkerville and this kind of improv has also had influence on my improv at school because the more I've noticed with doing improv like at 11.07 and doing workshops like that, and then also I've done a few improv scenes during shows, like during show rehearsals just to help with right. the scene, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I've just continued to notice more and more that when you are so grounded in that character and who you are and like a very simple thing of like what you want to attain, yeah. the scene flows a lot easier. And if you're, yeah, if you're just focused on, I, I need this from this other person, right. it's easy to push and get for that one thing. And of course, you still need to, you know, say yes and, and absorb the other offers that people give you. But you you have a little bit more of like one specific thing that you're fighting for. Yeah. So it's easy to push through that scene. So they've kind of yeah, Barkerville and improv at school have like really influenced each other. I think a lot of the time. Nice. So are you yeah. are you planning on like doing like would you are you wanting to do like more? Let's say when you move to Europe, are you wanting to do like get into the improv? seen out there I don't know how much improv there is in London but because like when when we've been going to school like as as often as you've been put in 1107 you you've always been a little bit more comfortable kind of in 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 scripted plays mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I think that's yeah, that's definitely true. I've always like I've loved loved eleven oh seven, but so the scripted plays have always been my kind of niche. Right. Um, to do that, and I think like yeah, I have no idea what there really is in London. I haven't done any research into that, but I think it would be so cool to do something like that. Um, I mean, one thing that I would love to do while in there is to be able to take a few classes in different things. So theater things or directing or acting or whatever yeah and if it's the kind of thing that i just happen to find a little like workshop or a little troupe or something that does improv that is something i would so be into doing over there yeah, cool um yeah i think it would be really fun and especially like when i when i come back to vancouver area and i'm settled there more permanently once i've you know decided to stop traveling with the world apparently right um yeah I think it's something that I I would love to get more involved in that because it does it does influence your theater a lot and like it it, it helps doing scripted theater to do some improv and to know that kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, it's also I'm I'm I mean, I'm sure it's similar with some improv groups in Vancouver where 1107 was like just like a big home for a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. It was De like there was just this family there yeah and i mean in the theater department we also have that kind of family so i yeah also had that but i know for people who weren't in the theater program that were in 1107 it was a, it was just a big family where you could go and you were loved and you could act like an idiot well, and it's it like, was fine i always i always think of uh our our friend our friend sam uh mm. who literally this past year was taking one theater course at Trinity just so that he would, so that he, you know, was able to do eleven oh seven. Yeah. Because that's yeah. where his that's where his tribe is. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that's cool. You mm -hmm. have directed some things. I have yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, You're correct. <laughs> first, first couple things they come to mind are uh, classic freshman mm -hmm. uh, comedy showcase, as mm -hmm. well as the wooden pair. Two <laughs> very opposite two things. <laughs> pretty opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, yeah. They're, I mean, they're both scripted. Yeah. That's about it. <laughs> That's about the only similar thing between them. Um. But you, you directed, did, did you, correct me if I'm wrong, you yeah. directed um, Classic Freshman before or after The Wooden Pair? That was, it was right afterwards. Right. 
Yes, okay. because that was... Yeah, we did. So we did New Gen, and I directed The Wooden Pair, and then basically directly after that, we started working on The Classic Freshman. Nice. So, yeah. I mean, you don't... You don't have to. You don't have to tell me what how how ridiculous the <laughs> the atmosphere of directing the classic freshman was. Oh, that um, was so crazy! <laughs> but what was it like, kind of coming out of such a? It's a very the wooden pair was a very heavy project, mm -hmm. um, short mm -hmm. as it was, uh, and so how? What was it kind of like? kind of shifting out of that and into this very kind of just kind of out there sketch comedy <laughs> where you're where you're also you're also directing the guy that wrote it yeah um yeah well i think so when i did the wooden pair that was the first directing project that i had done at trinity i had done a little bit of directing in high school but Okay. Part of me doesn't really count that because it yeah. was high school. <laughs> Neither do I. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, that was the first directing project I did at Trinity. And I had actually not taken the directing class yet. Right. Which I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to direct in my second year. But I also do wish that I could have taken the directing class before. Yeah, I'm sure there were there were many moments during the directing class where you were like, oh... This, this would have been useful. <laughs> I wish I had known this, or I exactly. might have been a little bit less dead. <laughs> yes. So, I, yeah, directing The Wooden Pair was definitely a very big learning curve because, the, honestly, I think... The biggest thing I learned, like, we had our exit interviews with Angela Conrad afterwards, and I was telling her, I'm like, the biggest thing I learned in this is how the director needs to be able to communicate so well. Yeah. And they need to be able to communicate with so many different types of people. Yeah. So when I was working on The Wooden Pair, there, oh. like, I had a very vivid image in my mind of what I wanted it to be, and, like, I knew what the set was was to look like, I knew what the costumes were to look like, um, and like, and I knew what the different moments in the play, what they should look like as well. Right. But it was very hard sometimes to communicate that. Um, and I mean, like, I truly, like, in the end, my actors did a fantastic job because that was a very, very heavy show, very hard show to do. Yeah. And it was only half an hour long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... That was like a huge thing that I learned during that. So then going into the classic freshman right after that, already knowing that it was a like much lighter show, it was just ridiculous and all of these funny little sketches that Tunji had uh, written. It it was already a very different vibe for the rehearsal room than the wooden pair was, and I had just come out of the wooden pair learning about learning more about how to communicate properly with different people um so that was a huge a huge thing that i really liked about going right into directing something directly after that because yeah then i then i knew like for a classic freshman i knew what i wanted kind of the set to be and i knew it had to be really simple because we were doing it in like a little auditorium yeah. and it couldn't be very elaborate and we were also didn't have a budget or anything like and that. And the fact that we had to like keep changing sets. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I mean it's that that was like a big thing that I learned that I was really good and it's honestly so hard sometimes to compare the two just because the vibes are so different in the rehearsal room. Yeah. And like, with the wooden pair, I wanted the vibe to be, like, really easy and fun, but because of all of the themes that we were dealing with that show, it's hard It's hard to do that sometimes, just because it is such a heavy show. Whereas in the classic Freshman, it was just a ridiculous show, so we just got to be ridiculous all the time anyway. Um, yeah, so... But, yeah, working on the on the classic Freshman was so much fun it was like it and it was honestly really wonderful working on it with people like you and Tunji and um yeah who I mean I've known already yeah I already 
know how to like talk to you and communicate with you guys. Yeah. And especially with Tunji, like Tunji wrote it, so he did have a good idea of what he wanted in it, but he also allowed me to refine that for him. Yeah. And make it a little bit more kind of make the picture a little clearer. Yeah, make the picture clearer. Like he he had good like outlines of what he wanted to do and I just got to color it in for him. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that was it was it was honestly a lot of fun. It, it was, was a ridiculous ridiculous process and I mean so much of that I think I just like got you guys I was like just do the scene and do it crazy just go for it yeah, like just go it's, big it's comedy you're allowed to just go big in this you can you yeah. can do that and That's... as long as you're staying grounded in your character and you're um like you're totally believing it it will you know make sense to the audience like that's something that I've noticed with theater and like directing comedy things and then also acting in comedy things is that yeah. you need to be if, if you are totally grounded in your character and you so believe everything that is happening it'll be hilarious yeah yeah well it's i've almost found like every now and then which is and this is kind of ironic for me because i'm i i consider myself much more of a comedy guy than a drama guy Mm -hmm. um, but I do find doing comedic scenes or comedic plays harder to do than than dra dramatic plays mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because yeah, not only do like it's it's not enough to play it as because you like you know it's funny like if you play if you play it like you know that it's funny it's gonna fall flat exactly because basically the audience is going to be like you're already amused by it and we're not going to laugh at people that are just laughing at their own joke mm -hmm. so, yeah yeah i've definitely noticed that as well and it's definitely you know a, it's a very different kind of thing we're doing dramatic shows because i've done both dramatic and comedic shows obviously so doing dramatic show is hard in its own way yeah and there's been, <laughs> there's been some times where, uh, I mean, with a few shows, with, uh, for instance, I mean, with, when we did Cover of Life, yeah. um, and also I had to write and perform a one-person show for my final class at Trinity. Right. Um, doing those kind of things, it was so hard because it was so painful to go through each time I did it, and right. I didn't want to go through the pain. Yeah. But it was almost a little bit easier connect to connect to that pain. Whereas when I've done comedic shows, like, um, well, like, let's say Smash and um, Comedy of Errors. Yeah. It is easier emotionally to go through it, but it's a little bit harder to connect to yeah. that character. Well, especially with, with, uh, with, com with Comedy of Errors, because, <laughs> like... I remember, I remember Carrie telling you, she's like, we, like, even though it, like, it's a comedy, but your per character in particular, there's a large chunk of the play where your life is basically falling apart. Yes. But for everyone <laughs> else, it's hilarious. Yes. And it, so... Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> I, I remember, um... Oh, I think it was the scene in Comedy of Errors where my character, Adriana, sees Tiphilus of Syracuse, who, you know, you know, is not her real husband, but yeah. she thinks it is her husband because they're twins. Yeah. Because Shakespeare loves his twins. <laughs> um, and she is trying, she's trying to get him back, and she's trying to, like, seduce him basically the whole scene. Yeah. And her, her heart is breaking the whole time, but... It's a hilarious scene because Antipolis is just like trying to push her away and yeah. trying to be like, I don't know who you are. Who, who like, is why, who? why is this crazy woman <laughs> like trying to sit on my lap and all of this stuff? <laughs> Whereas, yeah, so it was hilarious for the audience and especially doing performances. I remember that scene. Like, there were times that the audience was laughing so hard 
that they probably couldn't hear my lines properly because I had because it was Shakespeare I had to just keep going with the rhythm of yeah. the scene. Yeah. And well, there the were actions of... that we were there the were... actions that we were doing were you know overlapping the lines so I yeah. couldn't just stop saying the lines. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot, there were a, a few parts like that um particularly like the the disco scene. Mm -hmm. The disco scene with the disco queen. Yeah. Um, where they're doing this, like, crazy choreography and all the while, like, just chatting it up. Yeah. Like, it's... Yeah, so... <laughs> so, yeah, that scene for me was just... It was just so much fun to do. And I remember Stephen and I, after that scene, would just go off stage and we're like, they loved us! <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was a lot harder because everyone was laughing and having such a fun time doing it. Yeah. But for it to be believable, Adriana, like I had to be heartbroken the whole yeah. time. You can't so enjoy like, it. Okay. Exactly. I'm like, I can't enjoy the fact that I think my husband is not, you know, pushing me away and all of this stuff. Yeah. Um so yeah, it's definitely definitely a very different um, a, a very different form of difficultness, I guess. Yeah, it um, was doing. Comedy. It was a it was a different kind of version of a similar thing for me as a GN because, mm -hmm. I mean, he's the character that everyone kind of feels bad for. So there aren't a whole lot of parts where people are like laughing and ridic in ridicule at a GN, mm -hmm. just because he's this very like sympathetic story, but. Yeah. It was also weird being like one of the very one of the like very serious characters in this very ridiculous comedy. Mm hmm Where um I've got this like freaking four and a half page monologue. <laughs> <laughs> About your heartbreak. <laughs> yeah. And there's a part where I like the part where uh crap. There's the part where I talk about um where I'm like, and those are my, that's where my kids are right now. There you go. That's my story. Can I leave now? And like, yeah. I remember, that's one of my favorite parts of that scene because I just get to act absolutely pissed. Yeah. Uh, which is not a normal thing for me. So it was. <laughs> Just being pissed off, yeah. No, no, usually my brain is like, no, you need a good reason if you're going to be, like, l legitimately angry. So I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I'll give myself a, a fake legit reason. Mm -hmm. My imaginary mm -hmm. kids are missing, and this kid, <laughs> and this lady wants to freaking kill me for walking onto their turf. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. It's... Yeah, there's there's definitely something to be said about being the straight man in the comedy. Yeah. Because you always need that. Yes. Like if if you had if Comedy of Errors were a play where everybody was ridiculous, it yeah. would not be as funny. No. It it would be too much. Yeah. <laughs> it would be far too much. So characters like like Aegean and Adriana, which are the more kind of straight serious yeah. not like not as ridiculous ones where they I mean like Adrienne still has her funny scenes yeah. but it's not her that's being the funny one I yeah, guess the scene like the scene the scenes between you and um and Dr Dromeo of Syracuse mm -hmm. are hilarious well mm -hmm. the scenes between you and either of the Dromeos are hilarious yes because yep. <laughs> they're just they're because just going, hilarious. they're just going off on their on their crazy tirades and like mm -hmm. running around literally every inch of the theater, mm -hmm. and you're just sitting there like, wah, wah, who, who, wah. what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. So it's definitely it, it's it's hard sometimes to be that straight man, and like sometimes even just, you know. Sometimes your pride gets in the way because you're like, but yeah. I want to be the funny one. Yeah. But if you, if, if the straight person wasn't in that play, it wouldn't be funny. Yeah. Like it's, it's def it's needed for the play for sure. Yeah. 
Well, it's kind of like I, there were many times during the rehearsal where I like kind of compared Aegean's story to like freaking uh, Finding Nemo. (laughs) Yeah. It's it's very much like a where's my son kind of thing. Yeah. Um, And so if you think like, if you think of the movie Finding Nemo, it's a very funny movie. There are a lot of comedic, like just a lot of really funny moments in there because it's a Pixar Mm -hmm. film. Mm-hmm. But if you take all of those out, it basically becomes a fish version of Taken. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and yeah. So it's it's kind of interesting how you have to like you you very much have to like kind of toe that line. Mm-hmm. Um. Between you know we have these very these very outrageous characters with these very out there kind of mannerisms and speech patterns and such. Um, But at the heart of it, there is a story that you kind of, you can't really help but care about because it is Exactly. And it's that kind of, that that rule, there's that little rule in theater almost where it's like the comedy comes out of tragedy. Yeah. And it's this very strange rule, but it's, yeah, it's that kind of thing that when... It's almost when when someone else is in pain, but they're ridiculous doing it, we find it funny. Yeah. And so that that tragedy that, you know, Aegean is going through in comedy and Adriana is going through in comedy turns out to be funny to the audience yeah. because, you know, ridiculousness ensues because of it. But it's also almost like looking at this ridiculous... This ridiculous concept and these ridiculous things that happen because of tragedy, but it's also funny because it's not happening to the person watching it. Yeah. Well, it's I mean, happening to someone else. <laughs> yeah, I probably could have played it better um, if I had, because even like the part with, with the Gian's like four four page monologue, mm-hmm. there's a certain amount of humor in there because he's like, all right, I'm going to give you this long story. It's a very sad story. He, this is this is what's happened to me. It's all very sad, and the lady's like, "Keep going." I'm like, mm-hmm. "Okay." So there's more to this very sad story. It's still very sad. More sad things happened. Uh, <laughs> it's and it continues to be very sad. And she's like, "All right, mm-hmm. keep going." I'm like, "All right." So now my life is in this very sad state, and the situation that you put me in right now is very very sad. And now I'm done. Yeah, everything is just sad. Everything is sad. <laughs> it's your fault. Thank you for asking yeah. me to tell to share. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that's even like a kind of character that I mean we've seen a couple times in improv scenes. Yeah, that works so well. Yeah, because it's 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 less of a like roaring laughter type scene. But everyone just starts to feel for that character. Yeah. And they just think that it's adorable and it's so it's, sad, but it works. There's a very specific type of laughter that you get from those scenes where it's like, oh. Mm-hmm. oh. Exactly. It ends with that, like, kind of, oh. And you're like, exactly. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> sad uh. people. <laughs> <laughs> Sad people are funny. They're funny. <laughs> oh uh, man, I think it yeah. Might just make that the title of. The sad title sad of people this episode. are funny. Sad people are are funny. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. See, there it is. That's the laugh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well. Cool. Uh, well, I think I'm gonna, I think it's about time we, we wrap this up. We're yeah. hitting, the, hitting the 40 minute mark. I didn't, Oh my. I wasn't we sure. We can talk a lot. We can talk a lot. I, I talk a lot. <laughs> really? I really do. I haven't I, noticed. I, do. I know. I just ramble on. It was. My goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. on, honestly, I remember during the, the comedy of errors, the talk back session. <laughs> when yeah. Carrie was giving her a little like, br- like her little briefer, before before we did it, and she was like, just 
say your answer in like two to three sentences and then let them move on to the next question. And I couldn't help but be like, I feel like I know who this is for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so bad at doing uh, that. <laughs> about five months earlier. So can you tell me a little bit about your role? Goes on a 15 minute talk about feminism <sighs> and your life calling. Well, you know what? Sometimes those things just need to be said. <laughs> I'm not saying they didn't. <laughs> yeah, I I just like I like telling people about my life sometimes. <laughs> I get that. We're you're an yeah. actor. I, I am. I, I I talk for a living, so it's, it's like the same thing. Uh, I remember Rob talking about it during stage to screen, mm. where he's like, "Your friends never want to, never want to come with you when you're going to be hanging out with other actors, because the actors yeah. will only ever talk about themselves. They do, we just talk about ourselves it's, for some reason. It's just a natural habit. Yes, it is. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> but, anyway. Okay. I do have one thing that I just wanted to share because yes. I was talking with a friend a few days ago and I just thought this was a brilliant little little thing. I was like, this is just perfect about improv. Because yes. we were talking about, you know, improv. And so I feel like this is probably going to be like my life motto from now on. Good. And it was just, I basically just said, I was just like, you know what? Life is the longest form of improv. Man. That's it is just that's one, already how I've been living one my big life. long form no preparation one big long form no improv props. scene <laughs> exactly you just you go and you know what this is just how I'm like I need to live my life by this where you just go you make choices you commit to those choices sometimes those choices won't work <laughs> I think I need to be a little more grounded <laughs> in my character and sometimes sometimes those choices will be fantastic though and, yeah, and I was just like, hey, this is a good life motto to live by, I think. <laughs> life is just a freaking long form improv scene. It really, really is. The longest form. Just, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, would say, I would say that someone should write a play about that, but it sounds kind of counterproductive. <laughs> it's just life. Yeah. What just just have someone follow me around and be like, this is your play that you're gonna watch is it gonna for be... the rest of my life. It's gonna be like the <laughs> like the the student the twenties version of uh, Boyhood. <laughs> yep. This movie exactly. took twelve years to make. Was it worth it? Yes. Meh. Meh. <laughs> you know, I still actually haven't seen that movie. Neither so. have I. Well, there you go. So. Anyway, thank you so much for for coming on. Oh, thank you for course. asking was... me to be your to be my first guest. Yeah, no, honestly, like when you post on Facebook. Oh, hang on, you're you're cutting out for a second here. Oh, well. There you go. You're good. That's what happens when you live in a small town and barely have internet. I understand. <laughs> what were you saying? Um, I was just saying, like when you posted on Facebook about your podcast idea, I was like, that is such a cool idea, and mm. I like Connor, and I want to help him. <laughs> oh, good, because I need the help. <laughs> you need all. Oh, I, I mean, we all need help. I truly Let's be real. do. Yeah, um, we all do. So, <laughs> cool. Thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah. Hope, hope the rest of your summer goes well. Um. What whenabouts are you heading to Europe? November seventh is when I fly out. Ooh. Yeah. So you'll be I have able a countdown to... on my phone. You'll uh, <laughs> you'll be able to come and see a game of Love and Chance. I certainly will. That is honestly why I decided to not leave in the middle of October. Yes. <laughs> so I will be there for that show. Cool, cool. All right. Yeah. Well, I'll see you later then. Yes, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Cool. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, and that's uh, that's the first episode. Thank you so much for listening to Comedy Classroom. Um, I'll be posting on my social medias when the next episode is coming out. Um, until then, you can you can follow me on my 
my Instagram, which is at tallankyguy96. Um, that's T A three L's and then Anky Guy. Um, as well as my Twitter, which is uh, at Connor Teeson, I believe. Could be wrong. Um, yeah. Hope you guys all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next class.